23. Yeah, I'm sorry, me again. <laughs> um, I have to be honest with you. I was really nervous about giving this presentation. I've given a few presentations, probably over 1,700 um, in the last oh, 15 years or so, but this one uh, really was hard to pull together, and so uh, I, hope, I hope it worked out all right. Uh, I, don't, I think it's a terrible thing for a speaker to sort of apologize for a presentation before they even put it out there. Mark of a terrible speaker, but um, this one was hard because I had to talk about lawyer competence, and everything I started to write and do ended up turning into something of a rant. And so forgive me if, if hopefully it's not there. Let me introduce myself in a different way. I'm a special master, and I limit my practice to work as a special master in electronically stored information. And I absolutely love what I do. There's no, I mean, it's just wonderful. And to describe it, I would say it's a, a mix of being a judge that may be giving myself too much credit. It's a, quite a bit of, of geekdom, but there's also a fair amount of Oprah that creeps in as you try to get people to work and play well with others. I think of myself kind of like Mr. Wolf from Pulp Fiction. When brains are all over the inside of the case, they bring me in to help clean it up. And uh, I love the title, you see, because I grew up with I Dream of Genie, and there's a certain amount of my generation that loves being called master, what can I say? And I'm brought in by frustrated judges. They're tired of the carping. They're tired of the, of the incessant uh, things, the blame game, the complete breakdown in communication, that what whole thing. What we've got here is a failure, failure to, to communicate. communicate. And this idea that this whole idea of civility is gone and conflict becomes an end in itself. I'm no longer about the case or the client. I'm just about trying to beat that bastard on the other side. And so what I do is not really rocket science, although it involves, pardon me ladies, I'll turn your back on you, um, but it involves a, a fair amount of just basic parenting is how I, I look at it. Um, and a lot of my work is about trying to figure out fault, responsibility, culpability, whether someone uh, tried deliberately to deprive another side of the case of the information because as we know with amended 37E, and I won't let the cat out of the bag on that, that the state of mind of the spoliator or the alleged spoliator is key to the accessibility of certain uh, sanctions that have real teeth in them. And so I'm the one trying to decide if the dog got kicked or stumbled over and I see a whole lot of pissed off dogs. But I'm also, uh, the title that I cherish most is just that of teacher. And um, I'm a professor at the University of Texas at Austin where I teach electronic discovery and digital evidence. And at Georgetown Law School, where I'm not a professor, but I teach a week long boot camp course uh, on electronic discovery and digital evidence as well, working with a very fine faculty. And in the last 365 days, I've been talking to lawyers and teaching lawyers and law students at a lot of different places. Um, in Austin where I live, in San Antonio, uh, in Houston, Dallas, Lubbock, um, Louisiana and New Orleans, uh, Orlando, uh, the, the, the Daytona Beach, uh, Los Angeles, uh, Portland, Seattle, uh, that would be I guess Minnesota, Chicago, Southern Illinois, um, that would be Nashville, uh, that would be Toronto, New York, Washington DC, and here in Richmond. So it's been a busy year. Oh wait, I forgot, I'm sorry. I've also done it five times in England and in, in Frankfurt, Germany, but I was also down teaching uh, in Canberra, Australia, and in Sydney. So. Why do I tell you this? It's not just because I'm bragging about my frequent flyer miles, although, yes, frankly, they're not so bad. I'm here to tell you that whenever I travel and I see the world, I realize we live in a world that I call digital land or digital evidence land, in a place where the evidence that we need for our cases resides 
uh, on mobile devices and on hard drives and within servers and databases in network share allocations. It's in these email containers, these much lauded PSTs you've been hearing about. And it's also in the backup systems and the legacy systems that act as a time tunnel into the past, bringing us back to information that your clients have sworn multiple times over the years is gone and cannot be recovered from any source. In these third parties that hold a lot of information, in the personal systems that now commingle information as we work from home, and finally in the thing that's changing everything within the cloud and its underpinnings of infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and software as a service that combine to make things feasible such as the huge number of social networking opportunities out there. Well, that's where the world lives, folks, and I've seen it firsthand. But the lawyers I talk to still live in a joyous place called Paperland. Oh yeah, they may turn paper into something like a TIFF image, but it's still paper, and we love paper. I mean, we, we just adore paper in what we do, don't we? Let's face it, secretly, we all know someone who when we give them a piece of digital media, they hand it off to someone else and they say, print this out for me, won't you? But that's because we have mastered the very complex tools that allow us to work with paper. <laughs> and it's all the tools, isn't it? But here's the problem with that. Less than one-tenth of one percent of information born today will ever find its way onto a paper or paper-like format. Run that number by for a minute. Less than one-tenth of one percent. The vast and overwhelming majority of information, excluding movie film, finds its way onto electronically stored devices. The problem with that as lawyers from a competence standpoint is that we, as we have moved from the industrial age to the information age, we as a profession has ado have adopted our own unique way that has served us so well, lo these 30 years of the personal computer. When we are approached with issues of electronic discovery, we embrace them with this much enthusiasm, and when we actually have to deal with it, we have proven methods. Okay. It's about competence. It's about what makes us competent as professionals in the law today. This is us today when it comes to electronic information. When I serve as a special master and I hold hearings, I get this kind of clueless parroting of information. People who will come to me and with a straight face say, oh judge, they don't use electronic, I'm sorry, they don't call me judge. Uh, special master ball, they don't use electronic information. Or they can't come forward with any kind of useful metrics. I mean, you, you heard Judge Francis talk about why don't they come to me and tell me what the burden is. Give me the number. Show me what it's going to cost. But most of us are still satisfied with our stentorian tones and our manes of white hair and our gesticulation in making our advocacy. And then there are these ideas that when we do try to attach numbers to things, we can just go somewhere and get a page equivalency and we can tell the judge or the special master, well, the amount of stuff they want, judge, if we actually printed it out, it would reach from here to a celestial body. Well, folks, let me tell you, the only celestial body associated with that representation is your anus, because that's exactly where it comes from. There, there's no truth at all to that. Come on, that's a, sec that's a technical term. It's a planet, folks. So we are in a crisis of competence today. And I have to start with the beginning. And that's the question of, is discovery kind of nutty to begin with? Let's think about it for a minute. Imagine, if you will, that an alien came down to Earth. And this alien landed his or her spaceship, we never really could tell, and, and came out and asked a few questions of the American bar. And so the alien comes out and asks, what is this thing called discovery? We've been monitoring your CLE channels and we really need to know. And so we say how important discovery is. We say how the engine of justice only works when in an adversarial process you stoke it with the information that allows people to push the engine towards the truth. Sounds great. But then it starts getting specific. So, okay, we see how important this. Who do we task to locate this important evidence? Okay, well, we put the people most desiring that useful evidence not be found. We put them in charge. Okay. Well, what about who determines relevance? Well, we have an answer for that. We put in charge the determination of relevance those people who are most convinced that the claims lack any merit whatsoever, or the defenses. 
Okay, he's looking at us a little strangely. Finally, he asks the key question, well, who directs, directs this highly technical e-discovery? You must put scientists in charge, your brightest minds. And the answer, of course, is no. We put lawyers in charge of electronic evidence, the very people who fled science and technology and became <laughs> lawyers. Because if we'd known how to do math, we would be on Wall Street making real money, right? All right. So... This is where that's heading. We don't want that visit, folks. We definitely don't want that visit. Because this is what really is the problem with discovery. It's what I talked about earlier with quality. Why should we care about doing a better job helping our adversaries with the idea that somehow discovery or e-discovery done well is about helping the other side? And it's not. And I'm going to say something that you can take me to task for. But the fact of the matter is that we don't trust our adversaries to give us the stuff that they're supposed to turn over to us. Every one of us in the practice of law, and I hope every law student, will rise with some umbrage at that statement and will say how they would certainly turn over the most damaging thing to their client if it was properly requested in discovery and not privileged and not confidential and not otherwise protected by some applicable law or standard. And if it didn't fall off the table, and if we had the Senate actually came up, and if the wind were blowing from the east, we would turn it over. But we rationalize, don't we? Or let's put it this way, you don't. You always turn it over. But don't you know that your opponents rationalize? Don't you know that they find some basis on which to say that the words didn't really mean what they sound like on paper? And so this is really outside the scope, or this should have been copied to counsel, and therefore it's very likely meant to be a privileged attorney-client communication. It doesn't make us happy to know that that goes on, but I think we do. And I think we, we know or we fear that electronic discovery may become a means and incompetence in electronic discovery may become a simple and conscience-free way by which we can be denied information that will help us get closer to the truth. I mean, um, let's just skip that one. So I wanted to talk about the California ethics thing. But I think on probably at least four of the speeches so far, you've already heard that California has issued an opinion under its disciplinary system. I have to say that typical of, uh, typically of how we handle e-discovery in the law, it's an advisory opinion. It binds no one, all right? And it binds no member of the California bar. But I'll take it, okay? I still like it because it does set out nine skills that in order to be an ethical lawyer, the California Committee for Professional Responsibility and Conduct indicate must be considered by a lawyer. And they boil down to the notion of when you are in a case involving electronic evidence, you either need to know it and learn it get someone with you who knows it and learn it, or you need to say no to the case. So either you, you gotta learn it, get help, or get out. Now that's a very hard mandate. And we're gonna find ways to say, this isn't really a primarily an e-discovery case. But the e-discovery case, the non-e-discovery case is the exception. If you know electronic information, if you understand the systems around you, the greater likelihood is that every case in your office has a component of electronic evidence or that component may be actually decisive to the case. So let's talk first about assessment. The California folks say that we all need to be able to initially assess e-discovery needs and issues. In order to be able to do that, you have to understand your client's systems. You have to understand what forms of electronic information exist and what they signify. You have to be equipped to preserve information, and that means telling your client as well as instructing your client in terms of what information needs to be preserved and advising them of appropriate ways by which it can be preserved so as to protect the integrity of the evidence, including its metadata. 
And you have to be able to identify those sources. And that means understanding your client system. It means being able to talk to the IT personnel in a language that they understand. It means being able to have enough knowledge of systems to be suspicious when you're told something that shouldn't feel right to you. To be able to ask the next question and the question after that. Let me tell you this. No one has ever, in IT, no one has ever put down on the phone with a big grin and said, hey, the lawyers are coming down to talk to us. <laughs> Never happened, all right? They're IT, and they're very, very good people. I love IT. I love working with IT. But let me tell you, they got full-time jobs. And when the e-discovery stuff comes in, those full-time jobs generally don't suspend. They have to do two jobs. And so they're going to do whatever they can with the bounds of their conscience to say to you whatever they can to make you go away. You're not often going to get the answer you need on the first question. They're perfectly happy to give you back a string of acronyms and initializations and tell you about the flibbity gibbet and the will of the wisp and, and all that kind of stuff. And of course, we as lawyers, would be loath to admit we have no idea what they're talking about. We have to be the smartest people in the room. That's what we're told. When we graduate, you get a diploma from your law school and a commitment to sign that you will be the smartest person in every room from here on out. And so we don't want to tell them we don't know what they're talking about. We start eyeing the, the door and trying to flee. It's a perfect symbiotic relationship. They'll tell us what we need to know to go away, even if it's not true, and we will get the hell out of there as quick as we can. Now, Next thing we have to know are custodians. And this is probably where we do have the best ability. We're pretty darn good at identifying the people who were involved in things as long as we don't have to think about who handles the IT infrastructure and then we really aren't particularly good at all. We do have to be able to do both and we have to be able to look at the electronic trails to be able to make those decisions in a defensible way. And we touched on search a moment ago and you know a little bit about what it takes to perform appropriate searches. That was just scratching the surface of a few of the things you need to know about the limitations of search and tools and techniques that you must employ to be able to defend the quality and caliber of your searches. And that was, as I say, 10 minutes of an hour-long program. There was a whole lot of stuff to keep you up late at night that you didn't get to hear about. Collection we heard a little bit about as well. And that means, how do you make that decision? Between whether you image a hard drive, and, and it, do you do it in a forensically sound manner? Do you shut down the servers to do it? When you image the RAID, do you do it logically or do you image each of the component drives of the RAID and then have them reassembled by the vendor? Your head should be hurting with these kinds of questions. It's okay to say, that's not my job. I'm gonna hire somebody for that. But the problem is we all do not handle cases that have the budgets that you can always hire someone. Sometimes you're just gonna have to know the right answers yourself. And that means knowing about collection and how to minimize the, the uh, cost of collection and the scope of collection legitimately. And you have to be able to be qualified counsel so as to advise the client about the whole panoply of issues associated with their responsibilities vis-a-vis -vis collection and preservation of ESI. You have to be able to competently prepare for and meaningfully participate in, meet and confer in a cooperative fashion, in a relatively transparent fashion with your opponent. Most experiences at meet and confer now are either a, what would be called a drive-by meet and confer situation or that it is, I'm coming to meet with you, you'll give me your questions, I'll leave, and then maybe I will deign to respond to those questions later. Anybody ever had that experience at meet and confer that it was just sort of like a free shot at discovery by the opponent. You don't have to raise your hands up, but I see the fingers in the air. Thank you. And finally, you have to be able to understand how to produce electronically stored information. And that may seem a lot simpler to you than it is, but if you were working with me, for example, we'd be talking about native production, and you'd be asking me about Bates numbers, and you'd be asking me about verification, and how am I going to use this in court, and um, you know, did you know, for example, that if you produce a TIFF image instead of the native counterpart for a Word document, that the TIFF image in load file will be on the order of 15 times larger in size than the native file. 15 times, it didn't sound like a lot, except that if you were paying 
a vendor to ingest the data by the gigabyte or process it by the gigabyte, you're paying 15 times more than you would if you had simply asked for it in a more utile and complete way. I could spend and have spent all day talking about forms of production, but these are the kinds of things we have to know innately. And so what is wrong then with our ESI education? Well, first of all, we live in an apprenticeship model. Think about it. Most of us, when we graduated from law school, except possibly for, for taking, say, some moot court courses and advocacy instruction, participating in some mock this and moot that, probably did not emerge with any ability to draft pleadings, question witnesses, um, really pick a genuine jury, cross-examine an expert, and all of the things that as trial lawyers and litigators we must know how to do to be competent and successful. We, with e-discovery, the model of I will go to a firm as a young lawyer straight out of law school, I will learn all I can, I may be on a partnership track or it may be understood that I will go in somewhere else, but I will act as a sponge and they will train me. Well, guess what? How much e-discovery skill and lore do the senior partners at most of the big law firms have to hand down? None. They don't know anything about electronic discovery, and they're no more likely to want to admit that, apart from the cuteness factor, and there was a mention earlier of the cuteness factor, and that's, there are still lawyers who think it's cute to tell the judge that they don't even know how to turn on the computer in their office, all right? There should be a rule. When we go to the next set of rules, judge, I think there should be a rule that that counts as contempt. You can immediately imprison that person, <laughs> immediately. It's good for them, it's good for us, it's certainly good for the client, so please consider it. So apprenticeship model doesn't work for us. And here's another problem that we don't really acknowledge, and that is the people who make the standards for lawyers are never gonna set a standard that falls outside the circle they draw around themselves. Let's face it, no standard setter is gonna say, um, I'm going to set a standard that puts me out of business. And until we can get to the point where we can set standards that those who are old school or refuse to learn um, either must meet or are willing to put in place, we will really never move forward in solving the problems we must in dealing with the most prevalent forms of electronic information. Because let's face it, the attitude is, if it were really important, I must know it already. So therefore, electronic discovery and electronic evidence is either not real lawyer work, we hire people for that. You know, I went through this. There's, there's not a lot of benefit to being this long in the tooth in the practice of law, but one of the benefits is, I remember a time when lawyers' hands did not touch keyboards. It was unseemly for a lawyer to type his, principally his, or her own documents. Well, we've gotten past that, okay? And we've gotten a little bit more sensible, and that's where we are with electronic discovery. Right now, when you co a young law student gets out and says, you know, I know a lot about electronic discovery, the older lawyers look over the top of their glasses and say, we have people who do that sort of thing. But Soon, soon, I promise, soon, it's going to actually be a huge differentiator between the winners in the practice and the dinosaurs of the practice, soon. I said that 10 years ago and five years ago, and I'm saying it now, folks, it's going to happen anytime. But here's why it matters, because think about it, never in the course of human history have we left so many traces of our every thought and our every action behind. Never have we had so much objective base. information. The Eagle has landed. Back when I was a young man in 1969, when we landed on the moon, the pinnacle of technology was the Apollo 11 guidance computer with its 12,300 transistors. But today, the phone I carry in my pocket has two billion transistors, two billion, so 15,000 times more powerful than the most powerful computer of my youth. And the things that it can do are extraordinary. My phone is an absolute, well, slut. Okay, I'm sorry. He is a slut, okay? He's always trying to hook up. He's always trying to hook up with the Wi-Fi. He's always trying to hook up with the Bluetooth. He's always trying to hook up with somebody. You slut, you. But, but as a consequence, my phone 
is always pushing out information, is always pulling in information. Um, and, and, and as a consequence of that, we have never had more objective, trustworthy, precise information about what people do and think and their state of mind and their culpability than we've ever had before. It's such a banquet that we are terrified of it, but as lawyers, we should be excited. We should be saying, what a gift to live in an era where I don't have to rely upon the untrustworthy recollections of a person who may have seen the fight from 20 yards away and says he saw it because it was moon bright, for those of you who remember the old story about Abraham Lincoln. I keep pushing the button and it keeps not wanting to go forward. Let's see if it's locked up. This may be the way of telling me I'm running out of time. Don't forget my... Oh, you know, I wish I'd thought to say something about the automobile. Um, let's see if we can cure that problem. Location services. If, you go, if I go into my phone and I drill down to settings, privacy, location services, system services, frequent locations, if you're an iPhone user, drill, drill down. You're going to see everywhere you've been. And it's there. And if, you, if you're interested in Facebook users, the average Facebook user goes there 14 times a day for an average time spent on Facebook each and every day of 40 minutes. That means if you, like me, don't go every day, may not even go every week, some poor soul is having to pick up your slack. <laughs> 28 times a day, 42 times a day. It's awful for them what they have to do for you. And then we have Increasingly, we have law enforcement carrying around body cams, and most of us in a few years, believe it or not, will be carrying around similar devices that will re record everything we see and hear. Just as, don't forget cars, just as our cars today, whether it be through Apple Play or Android Auto or a host of other services that are built into modern cars and cars that are coming, keep track of an enormous amount of information. Your car is increasingly becoming grand central to the storage of a lot of information about your communications. As I say, never in human history have we had so much probative and reliable evidence to draw on. And don't worry. I know you feel a little intimidated because look where we are. But stand by, because this is where we will be in five years' time. At the rate of growth, this is the volume we will see, nearly 45 zettabytes by 2020. Now you can choose today, as we sat and talked about lawyer competence, you can make a choice. This will be something I'm going to be afraid of, or this is something I'm going to embrace. This is something that I'm going to make a decision, I'm going to get my arms around, because recognizing that most of my colleagues will not, I will have a huge advantage for my clients. I will win more cases. I will settle more cases for lower values, fairer results, more compensation deserved by my clients. Whatever it is you want, think of this as an opportunity. We already did that. We did that. What are you doing here? So we have to know. Do you know what's in this thing? All of us have this. Everyone, I used to ask audiences, how many of you have a device on your, on your person capable of storing more than you know, a gigabyte of information and creating full motion video? And I don't even do it anymore. I don't want to meet the person who now says they don't have a device like this. They're probably not here. They're living in a piece of tin in the desert under a piece of... <laughs> But do you know what's in here? Do you know how to preserve it? Do you know what it even is called so you can refer to it when you speak to the experts who may have to act for you? Do you know how to prove it up? Do you know how to review it? Are you gonna bring it in concordance and summation? Are you gonna bring it into relativity or whatever it is you may use or not use anything in order to be able to review information? And will you understand what it means? Because you've heard people continue to talk about documents. But a lot of what we're dealing with as evidence today and what's coming are not documents, they're data. And that means that you have to understand what they mean in context and you must know to be able to challenge it in court. And so whose job is it to know? I argue that it is your job, our job as lawyers to know. And whose job is it to teach? That's a bigger question. Is it the Bar Association's job?
Is it CLE providers? Is it law schools like this fine institution? We don't have answers to that yet, but we need a Manhattan Project to bring us up to speed. We need to decide what our core curriculum will be. I mean, why do doctors, dermatologists study microbiology and biochemistry just to inject Botox in people's foreheads, right? Why do they do that? And we don't question why doctors need to learn the fundamentals of the science of medicine, even if they're going to do a job that really doesn't use that science anymore. And the answer is that foundation matters. And as I said to you earlier, if you would stop trying to figure out a rule for how to deal with everything in advance, because it's changing all the time, your rules and your checklists will never be sufficient. And instead say, you know, I'm going to take a little time to really learn this stuff, not to learn it as a computer scientist, but to learn it as as a lawyer who needs to know information technology, the, which is the entire ebb and flow of the things we deal with, and that is information and evidence. And so I, I wanted to point out to you, for those of you who might like to change your life uh, and, and get it down, and I, and I have no financial interest in this, I'm not compensated for participation nor any other members of the faculty, but with Judge John Facciola and a very fine, small, interested faculty, we spend a week at a boot camp every first week, uh, every first two weeks in June in DC at Georgetown, and we teach people from the ground up understanding electronic evidence, three days of technology and the balance, doing things like drafting and competitive exercise. There's even a workbook, and you can see it on my website if you're curious, with exercises. My law students, the people at the boot camp, we sit them down and the first thing we show them is they can get this stuff. No matter how old they are, no matter how much they think they couldn't understand their can opener, we show them that if they build on it, bit by bit, eating the elephant, if you will, one morsel at a time, that they can become quite sophisticated in understanding how electronic information is created and stored, processed, searched, and produced. So um, we make them use professional tools. We teach them the glossary, the words to use. We, of course, cover the major cases, or I do in this, in this case. Uh, in my law student law class, I bring in some of the best speakers in this area and the nation. It can be done. In fact, even in the law class, we take them to, the, to a supercomputer and let them mess around with the supercomputer. Because while learning electronic evidence is daunting, it's really not that hard. It's certainly no harder than it was for us to learn to drive an automobile, for example. And learning to drive a car served us so well for so much of our life. So let me close by saying it is time for us to make a promise to ourselves. It's time for us to do something, to stop faking it, to roll up our sleeves and learn to use some new tools of the practice and get our hands a little dirty with data. It doesn't hurt, it's fun, and you can finally push back with your teenager at the dinner table. Because the most effective tool in e-discovery is not something you buy. It is not something the court orders you to do. The most effective tool in e-discovery e is what it has always been in law, and that is a lawyer who knows what she is talking about. And so thank you for your patience, ladies and gentlemen. Make the promise that you're going to be competent. When we meet here again next year, say to yourself, when I come back next year, I'm going to get everything they were talking about. And I look forward to shaking your hand when that happens. Thank you.